Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this seminar on QRA of linear risk sources. My name is Mark Taylor, and I'm a principal consultant of RiskTech based in Aberdeen in Scotland. Thank you very much for joining us and welcome to this RiskTech seminar. This is the seventh of the current series which we've been running since May last year. We asked you uh, during the last year's webinar series as to what topics you'd like us to cover in this fifth series. And as a result, we're presenting eight of the most popular requests. So today's subject, as I said, is about pipeline routing QRA. Um, hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. You also requested that the webinar should be slightly longer to cover a bit more detail, and therefore we've extended them to take an hour with about 45 minutes for the presentation, and then there's 15 minutes for Q&A after the presentation. Just a quick spot of housekeeping for you. We've muted everybody so that the sound won't be distorted by background noise. If you'd like to ask questions, and we do encourage you to ask questions, then please use the Q&A function. Just click the speech bubble in the middle of the, control, of the controls at the bottom of your screen. To keep, it, to keep it simple, don't use the chat function. Just please use the q and I'll keep track of the questions and we will aim to answer as many as we can at the end of the session. We have about an hour, so we should be able to get through quite a few questions in total. Uh, I'd now like to very briefly introduce this tech for those of you who don't know us. Apologize to everybody who's heard this dozens of times before, so I'll be very quick. Uh, this tech is a specialist safety and risk consultancy founded in 2001, so this is our 20th anniversary. Uh, we specialize in risk analysis. We carry out training related to risk analysis. For example, we have an online graduate training program, which we run with Liverpool John Moore. We also carry out resourcing so we can supply specialist engineers to projects where they have a skill shortage. And we're also involved in um, inspection and asset integrity and carry out uh, research and development uh, to improve the way that uh, risk analysis is carried out and to improve sustainability. I won't go on any more about this tech. Uh, you can find lots of information about us on our website. But I do want to introduce our speaker, uh, George Omered. So George is also a principal consultant and George leads the risk tech North American technical and safety teams. George has 30 years of experience uh, in engineering, risk and reliability analysis, uh, covering a range of industries, including oil and gas, process and transport. He's an expert on QRA um, and has unique uh, skills, particularly in the line of linear QRA, which is the uh, subject of today's webinar. George lives in Calgary, and he likes to play in the mountains with his dog called Loki. I will now hand over to George to run you through the seminar. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, to the uh, to the webinar on the, on linear resources. So um, we're here today. The idea of the uh, the presentation is to um, introduce the uh, the modelling of uh, linear resources. Um, how is it different to uh, to other risk modeling of sort of first um, points or sort of area sources like a, a facility? Um, and uh, where is the uh, the data um, kind of available to uh, to do this? Um, mainly, I've picked an example um, about uh, onshore pipelines because um, that's what uh, what we've been doing a lot of uh, a lot of in uh, in North America uh, recently. But I'll also show you some examples of marine. Um, uh, rail and uh, road models, um, but the, uh, the the principles um, are, uh, are are the same, um, really. 
So what, what are linear risk sources? Um, well, as I said, pipelines is, is kind of an obvious, obvious one. But also there's um, transport of dangerous goods, um, which is something that happens uh, all the time at the moment, but maybe maybe this will this could be uh, have um, increased in sort of prominence with uh, with renewables and transport of hydrogen or other other sort of energy uh, transportation sources such as ammonia. But, um, but these are things like rail, um, road, uh, marine, and um, I guess you could say aviation. Um, we, we also do risk analysis, and uh, I have done risk analysis for um, road and marine transport and rail, but um, for risks to, uh, to passengers and, and workers and maintainers and that sort of thing. But really, in, in this webinar, we're talking about um, risks uh, from a transportation route to sort of external um, stakeholders. So uh, that's the sort of context. Um, if, if anybody wants to get in touch with about uh, rail and road and the marine risk management, we're, uh, we're quite happy to discuss it. So onshore pipelines, um, quite a political hot potato in, uh, in, in North America at least. Um, uh, extensive uh, network of, uh, of onshore pipes, um, pipelines across, across North America as, as is shown about these, this, uh, uh, with this um, map of the, uh, of the crude oil uh, pipelines um, and refineries in, uh, in, uh, in, in the US and, and Canada. Um, also, there's a, there's a whole host of other lines uh, under the ground, um, natural gas, um, sour gas, um, all, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of things, natural gas, liquid trans transportation, you know, LPGs and that sort of thing. So um, obviously uh, quite important. And, and uh, as, a, as a legacy thing, these, these often run quite close to areas of, um, of uh, population where people live. So, so why is it why is this different? I guess um, I guess the sort of fundamental um, uh, thing is that um, you have a you have a, a, a linear source, and the, the, the source has a lot of I, I guess an infinite number of or a theoretical infinite number of sort of consequences in uh, in sort of time and space, and that a, a point away from the the pipeline will see um, will see all the um, incidents in a length of pipeline that's kind of defined by the, um, the consequence distance um, and obviously accounted for factors such as, as, as wind, uh, wind directionality. And, and this is quite mathematically simple to work out if you're just talking about a single point that you're interested in. Um, you can just work that out um, by hand if you, if you really wanted to. But obviously for more, when you, you want a full picture of the, of the risk around, uh, around the line. So, um, generally, this is um, in the model, as I'll show you later, these are split up into a, a number of, um, of, of point sources with, uh, with similar characteristics and, and a spacing um, of a suitable resolution to give a, a reasonable picture um, of the risk. Um, <clears throat> also for pipelines, there's kind of differences in, in the consequences. Um, generally because they're buried, but uh, generally, but not always. Some, some pipelines in the far north of <coughs> tend to be um, not buried because of kind of, you can't get them into the permafrost, so they're, they're on, on sleepers, but uh, that, that might, that's a bit more straightforward to, uh, to model. So um, a usual selection of, um, of consequences, fires, so you can have pool fires, um, flash fires, jet fires. Um, Potentially explosions, but uh, but maybe less so because these uh, these tend to be out in the open with with limited um, congestion, uh, and obviously if you've got a toxic material in your line, uh, toxic effects. So um, particularly the larger releases, um, they tend to dig a big hole, and uh, uh, or, and and this can. <coughs> change the sort of characteristics, have the velocity um, limited by interaction with the, with the, uh, the overburden, um, the, the, the release material might hit the side or the bottom of the crater and, uh, and, and limit, the, uh, limit the velocity and change in the, um, some of the uh, consequences and, and how they are modeled. Here we've got some, uh, got some pictures of, uh, of, the, uh, of the sort of 
um, end results uh, following, uh, I guess in most cases, full bore ruptures. So you get a you get an idea of scale for these two guys peering into this this large crater. Um, something here from within the crater. Um, some something here where you've got a, uh, a probably a smaller natural gas line that somebody's hit with this uh, earth moving equipment. Um, and the actual sort of release in uh, in uh, in progress. And here's another uh, another crater. Just to uh, just to get some some idea of, of what of what we're talking about. Here's a here's a sort of a literature survey we we did um, probably about ten years ago on the <coughs> on the on the sizes of, of the craters um, in when we were developing a pipeline rule set for for a project. You can see that you get some quite big sizes, maybe like a hundred feet, thirty meters in diameter. The one does stand out as a um, been quite a long, long and thin one. Uh, not so, not quite sure why, but um, here we are again. Some um, nice pictures of of what the uh, the aftermath looks like. So the extent of the the fire damage. Or the, or the or the damage um, obviously needs uh, modeling as part of uh, one of the steps of the quantitative uh, risk analysis of um, analyzing the consequences and then um, estimating that the frequency to combine them together to be risk is good aerial view of um, I think it's I think it's this one's the, the close-up where these two guys are you can you can see them there you can see the um, this is a uh, this is a flam this is a gas line, um, and it was described as a an explosion. It was in the, it was in Virginia. It did demolish these these two homes here, <coughs> which are quite close to the, uh, the site. Uh, sorry, the the um, the right of way of the pipeline. Um, five people were injured, but uh, fortunately nobody was um, was injured. Uh, nobody was killed. Uh, and this was um, this was believed to have been caused by corrosion, and um, and the thing with uh, thing with pipelines is the, I guess the corrosion holes tend to be tend to be quite small, but um, once uh, defects or or corrosion hole, uh, defects get about a certain size, that you can uh, the uh, the failure unzips to be a kind of full um, full bore rupture. Um, how do we uh, how do we model these uh, these consequences? The this subtlety in uh, in the uh, in the consequence um, um, impacts. This is um, this is from um, the uh, OGP risk assessment data directory, and it's kind of a, a public domain guidance on on how to model things. So it's it's useful to to point out. And it's uh, it's freely available um, if you want to go. Google it. So, typically for <clears throat> releases greater than about um, about two inches, uh, treat them as um, quarter going upward at full velocity, fifty percent um, horizontal as, um, at a reduced velocity, um, and uh, twenty five percent downward, um, but sort of treated as if, as if it's sort of bouncing back off the uh, off the base of the um, of the crater with a, a much lower velocity of um, of five meters per second. Um, so small releases, if you choose to uh, choose to model them, um, just treat it as, as five meters per second as they percolate through the uh, soil um, overburden uh, and, and gradually come out of the uh, of the soil. Uh, I mean, these might not, in fact, when you analyze them, have any any significant um, consequences. So you could possibly exclude these um, from the analysis. Um, horizontal is could be just just modeled however you you choose to uh, to to model them. Something maybe to give you a, a worst case dispersion and fire extent, which which um, which might be might be unimpinged or it might be impinged for for uh, for dispersion. Typical hole sizes. Um, this is um, this is something from a from a project. So um, take the small ones. Maybe maybe don't actually don't actually model those, um, and, and you lump that sort of thing into, into moderate holes. 
unlike um, unlike sort of process facility uh, piping and equipment releases, the smallest smallest hole size modelled is generally something about twenty millimeters, um, something close to a to an inch, which which in the pipeline world are, are called um, uh, sometimes referred to as uh, pinholes or cracks. This could be a sort of pitting corrosion hole or or, or similar. Um, and it re represented by um, by a twenty millimeter hole, something something larger, um, which is maybe two inches. So typically, earth moving equipment um, teeth on the on the buckets are, are about this size. So um, as we'll see in the frequency bit, um, most of uh, most of pipeline releases maybe. 30, 40 percent are caused by um, third party interaction, people trying to dig up um, pipelines when they don't know they're there. So that's uh, that's to represent that, that sort of incident. Um, so the um, in, impact of earth moving equipment could be could be larger. So a backhoe might put a 130 mil hole into a uh, into a line. And uh, and and generally when <coughs> Without doing any specific analysis, which you can do on, on pipelines, um, it, it's a common assumption that anything larger than that would uh, really only be a full bore rupture because larger holes tend to propagate to, to full bore ruptures. Uh, what models do you use? Well, um, we, um, we've used all sorts of models, but uh, generally, generally we use this kind of usual ones that, that are common in, in industry practice, um, such as um, FAST um, or, or Safeti um, and, uh, and FRED. Um, and FRED is one of is, is, uh, Shell's um, uh, consequence analysis software, which is actually sort of uh, available outside, the, outside Shell. Um, uh, there, are, there are other, other perfectly valid models as well, and, and occasionally we've used um, specific pipeline um, models that that um, for sort of high pressure or complex transient situations <coughs> that we try to uh, try to uh, try to get a better handle on. Uh, so these have included um, Olga, which is a Statoil Sintef developed. Um, oil and gas pipeline simulator, uh, which is now uh, marketed by uh, Slumberger. Um, also we used um, Pipe Tech, which is a, a CFD uh, simulator. <coughs> I'm sure um, I'm sure other models um, exist. And um, I, I run through a sort of um, Safeti example of, of what the what the kind of what the inputs look like to uh, to a model uh, later on in the uh, in the presentation. Frequency analysis, obviously an, another important key aspect of, uh, of risk analysis. So we've we've worked out the consequences, how far um, people can be uh, be affected around the line by the various um, uh, various types of, of impacts that I outlined. So here we look at how likely releases are. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a I have a later slide on sort of input data, but there's quite a lot of public domain um, input data that, uh, that's uh, available. Um, probably some of the best is, uh, is, the, uh, is taken from Europe, EGIG and, and Konkawe, which is for gas and liquid pipelines respectively. There's some information for North America in, in the US and, and Canada. It, um, it doesn't tend to be sort of sliced up quite as, uh, quite as conveniently as, as the uh, European data. And, uh, and as we'll see, pipelines um, in uh, in mostly in the sort of Western developed world have similar um, leak uh, frequencies anyway. Um, so the general process is to um, is to take some base data, examine the um, the causes, and uh, try to estimate how this is impacted by the the individual characteristics of the um, of the pipeline. In question, so uh, diameter, <coughs> um, the age, uh, how deep it's buried, the the wall thickness and safety factor in the design and uh, the material in the uh, in the line as well. Is it corrosive, uh, etc. And, uh, and and things on the routes that uh, that may be um, 
may be important, such as uh, geotechnical activity. And then to, to make some um, justified uh, judgment on how on, on whether these um, causes should be reduced or increased um, as appropriate. Uh, and document your uh, your rationale. So here is uh, the data for a, a natural gas pipeline of uh, I can't remember the diameter, but um, you'll see that the the leak the overall leak frequency is is something of the order of of uh, ten to the minus four per kilometer. Um, and those of you that that do QRA on a regular basis will will see that this is substantially lower than um, the, the process uh, pipe work because um, of a range of factors, I guess, because it's primarily because of, of burial and, uh, and uh, I guess a more consistent um, material known throughout flowing through the, the line. Um, so there's <coughs> various modification factors that can be, be applied. This is a, something typical we apply for a, a large gas pipeline. Some stuff, uh, some information from the Institute of Gas Engineers that's uh, found its way into the um, into the into an appendix in BS eighty ten <coughs> has some has some justified factors for uh, to apply to um, to uh, a pipeline depending on the, the diameter, the age, uh, the burial depth, um, the wall thickness, um, and this sort of thing. So um, the it, it, won't, it won't come as a surprise that, um, that the deeper a line is buried, the less likely it's to be dug up by a, by a farmer putting a ditch in, in his field. Also larger uh, diameter lines are more resilient to, um, to external damage because you know a backhoe can't hook a 30 inch diameter line where it, can, it could easily hook a 10 uh, inch diameter line and pull it out of the ground. So there's, there's these factors, there's, there's other factors such as um, concrete slabbing over the over the line, or uh, warning tape that uh, that's provided to uh, to warn um, somebody that, that there's a line below before they actually reach the line. So those sort of factors uh, can be applied. Um, so uh, an examination of the data also um, showed that uh, construction material defects um, uh, after for, for lines um, after 1980 were. Uh, substantially lower um, failures due to corrosion um, for higher wall thickness lines were were, were non credible, so they they were sort of um, they were factored down significantly, but not eliminated in uh, in entirely. Uh, and and here we were talking about somewhere that was geotechnically unstable, <coughs> and. Um, based on an engineering judgment with uh, in discussions with uh, geotechnical engineers a, a factor was applied to uh, to increase the, the likelihood of, uh, of failures due to uh, due to ground movement so modification factors were, were applied <coughs> a big one to reduce the uh, the uh, external in interference um, uh, um, contribution so really that all, all, all this does is reduce the, the overall uh, leak frequency data uh, to, to something that's roughly a third of, of the original original value. And this is split up by, by hole size based on also on historical um, um, information. You can see that um, there's a different distribution per cause by um, uh, Depend so obviously some um, some causes are more likely to cause full ball ruptures, and some more likely to cause small ones, so, uh, such as hot tapping error. This has always sort of kind of puzzled me that somebody would uh, kind of try to drill into a, a live line, but I guess it uh, it has happened historically. So, so that's the the base frequency analysis that uh, that gives you per hole size that feeds into the, the frequency. There's obviously um, another element to the likelihood calculation, which is uh, conditional probabilities. So um, things like uh, weather, um, which is um, available from a whole host of, of paid or public domain um, information, depending on your um, how much you, you're willing to, uh, to stump up. Um, and uh, 
ignition probability. So there's there is a range of of, uh, of information um, on this, um, such as from the um, the IP uh, Institute of Petroleum correlations that's, uh, that are, are also um, reflected in another OGP risk assessment data directory. <clears throat> so that's one possible um, source. It's um, it uh, takes the um, leak rate and, uh, and has a correlation based on, on, the, on the leak rate and you, you pick a suitable um, scenario for, for your pipeline and, uh, and the surroundings um, and as you can see once you get above a certain level the, uh, the leak frequency kind of um, maxes out. There's some data from, from, from eGIG based on um, the sort of histo just historical information so you can see that there is quite a large um, likelihood of ignition of large uh, lines uh, when they rupture, possibly because they might, they, it's a substantial release of energy with flying stones, part, bits of the pipeline, um, earth, static electricity generation, and that sort of thing. So that could, um, um, that's uh, a factor to, uh, to take in, into account. You can see that some of these correlations max out at an ignition, ignition probability of one for this sort of LPG pipeline in, in an industrial setting. So I'll just show, show you how this sort of looks in uh, in, in Sofeti because I, I, I've talked about the sort of inputs, but but what does this what does this actually look like? Um, well, there is a there is a in DMV's um, fast risk or, or Sofeti, whatever you want to call it. There is a a route. Um, there is a route modelling. Um, so this could be anything. As I said, it could be a it could be a pipeline, it could be a pipe rack, it could be um, a, a road route, it could be a, a rail route. Um, so you have you have a route and you, you draw it on your on your map uh, and it's it's there and you associate the in the model group you have your range of um, of consequences um, that I've that I've mentioned. And then if you go to the pipeline pipeline um, dialogue. It says um, it says the model group, and then it says you say how far you want these to be spaced, and then you say what the failure frequency is um, per unit length, uh, and then you give uh, and then you you give a, a length of, of segment. So this is the total for all the events. So if you go back here, you think it's 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 the total for all of these total leak frequency. Uh, and then for the consequences, you you put in a probability which is a fraction for each of those. And if these are just modeled like any other scenario, if um, if you want to if you want to model them that way. Um, so they don't have an absolute frequency; they they have a fraction. Uh, and that's the proportion of the failure frequency for the overall uh, uh, route that you've got, uh, and then then they should they should add up to uh, to one. I suppose it's worth briefly mentioning that there's there is a long pipeline model in uh, in in FAST that has been validated uh, against um, against some sort of uh, quite a while ago against some. Um, actual rupture tests and it's also been developed over the years to gradually get more uh, complex and take into account more uh, more factors so but it's uh, it's uh, it's can't be used for um for, for transport routes and it, it's only really applicable to gas lines so it allows you to put in um the pipeline um uh depth uh, burial depth and um uh, and, and the, the cover soil cover you can <clears throat> you can put um put valves in um and uh, a probability of failure as well if you want so this these do limit uh, the the quantity released and may may have an impact on on the risk although more so for toxics than than for flammables because of the the time um that uh, that uh, releases reach equilibrium uh, and it does auto generate some some uh, sections if you want and it also um, you can define a failure frequency um, and 
uh, and, it, and it automatically spaces the events out so you get sort of smooth risk contours rather than um, little little blobs um, and you can add add holes holes sizes i mean in some earlier versions of Safeti it would only or and fast it would only model um, things close to full bore ruptures but and that's been kind of rectified and then you uh, you define the contribution um, of each um, okay so that's that's just a quick view of how how a, an actual model um, um, would look in in some software that other other software um, is available <laughs> as uh, as people like to say on, on um, in the media sometimes uh, risk criteria so um, it's all very well having a number, but it's, it's pretty meaningless if you don't know where it sits in the uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I think some people view these these as a bit outdated, but they, these are still in common uh, use in and that they ha have actually been written into some some sort of uh, local legislation in, in Canada. So uh, um, it's the my guidelines for kind of acceptable risk um, levels for, for land use planning. So this, this might be used by a regulator when they're looking at a new pipeline and where it crosses close to um, close to uh, areas of, of population. So um, where we're talking about um, one time sent to the minus four, uh, you would want to want really no, um, no land use um, by by people i mean i guess you might tolerate occasional uh, use by people sort of um wandering around and uh, but no sort of permanent but and then between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 5 you talk about sort of like something that's very low density in terms of people so <coughs> um sort of light manufacturing warehouses open spaces where people would be there in a, on a sort of transient basis and not uh, not permanently so um, parks and, and golf courses and that sort of thing. Um, between 10 to the minus five and 10 to the minus six, you might be talking about sort of commercial or, or low density residential. And, and then outside 10 to the minus six, which is kind of getting to the levels of, of uh, where people voluntarily accept um, everyday sources of risk, such as sort of lightning and that sort of thing. Um, but then you, there'd be no sort of uh, limitation. Obviously, there's um, society in general um, is uh, is more outraged when you kill a thousand people than when you, you when you kill um, one person, and you could have all sorts of philosophical discussions about that. But there's a, a, a group group or societal risk um, criteria um, that uh, that is an attempt to uh, to address this. So um, it has a a sliding scale where um, Risks, risks that affect more people are, are have a lower frequency and are less tolerable, and uh, and this is a uh, this is from the British Columbia um, LNG regulations, and is actually just a copy from um, NFPA 59A, but um, but generally there's a there's kind of an anchor point somewhere um, at at probably maybe a typical. Um, individual risk criteria that people use at one time 10 to the minus three for one person and there's a gradient and sometimes there's um, inflection lines as well where the, even the higher levels are deemed um, even less tolerable than the, the lower levels I think I think Hong Kong has 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 an inflection point and some companies do uh, internally so um, we have a, an intolerable line and then we have something where you need to demonstrate risks for a, a LARP and, and almost always risks land in this, this zone. And then, um, then you have a, what, whatever you want to call it, tolerable, broadly acceptable, um, that, sort of, that sort of thing. So we, we put in the areas of surround, surrounding population, population densities, uh, and that sort of thing. And we can, we can model these uh, as well so people can make uh, value judgments on, on that. Um, individual risk. Um, so this is um, also set out. So um, risk to um, risk to the public here. This is again from. This is not quite legislation in uh, British Columbia, but it's in the in the CSA Z two seven six, which is about LNG facilities. 
and is referred to in um, in uh, the LNG development manual in British Columbia. So it's kind of a legisl legislative expectation. So here we see intolerable risks are um, 10 to the minus four, a LARP, and then broadly acceptable risks. And those kind of align with the uh, those MIAC um, uh, guidelines. So location specific individual risk, which I, I should have explained before, is kind of a theoretical measure of risk. Imagining that somebody lives at, at a point in space uh, 365 days a year, uh, 24 hours a day. So obviously it's quite um, conservative um, and it's generally applied to uh, to public or, or third parties where um, you don't have any um, control over over them or what they're doing or, um, or, or that sort of thing. Risk to, to workers is, is kind of generally factored by the time they're exposed. And there's also a, a kind of a, a higher criteria as well because they're, um, they're, they're gen generally informed, they're, they're paid to, to be there. Um, they should, should be, um, there should be risk management and emergency response measures in place to, to protect them and that sort of thing. So generally uh, they're, they're, they, are, they have consciously accepted the, the, the risks. Uh, and they, and there's a, this is a very common t level, which is 10 to the minus three. Um, and um, uh, tolerable for LARP between um, 10 to the minus three and 10 to the minus six. Um, so uh, gen generally getting close to this target is, is, is not usually the case for on onshore facilities. You're down in the 10 to the minus fours. Um, if you're getting risks up at this level, it's comparable with some high risk sort of industries such as forestry or mining, which is obviously is, is not, um, not good. But generally for an onshore um, oil and gas facility, or uh, as we'll come to in pipelines, the risk from pipelines is, is much lower. Um, so data sources, as I've mentioned, there's the uh, European um, gas, uh, gas uh, statistics that's uh, uh, and Konkawi, which is for oil pipelines. Um, and the Alberta Energy and Utility Board, which is now called the AER, has, I'm not sure they've updated it for a while, but they've got some pipeline um, leak data that's particularly good if you have sour lines, although you need to use it um, with care because it's got a lot of short and it's got a lot of small diameter lines. It's got some lines with esoteric um, materials of construction as well. So. Um, some people have used this data for natural gas, just natural gas um, pipeline sales quality spec, and it, it, it's not really representative in, in, for, for that. US DOT has got a lot of information um, uh, on pipeline releases. It's quite hard to sort of dig out um, release sizes, and it's also the data's quite raw, so it needs a bit of uh, number crunching. Uh, and there's, there's some information in the um, Institute of Oil and Gas Risk Assessment Data Directories. Um, I can't remember how old this comparison is, but this is a, a bit of a data comparison here of EGIG, uh, the US DOT, uh, I think that's an Australian one, um, that, that's a UK, so that's the UK share of the EGIG data. Energy Utility Board, um, uh, Natural Gas and Sour, and the, and the NEB, which is a Canadian uh, federal uh, regulator. Um, so it kind of does show that lines have a um, kind of, I guess, a broadly similar order of magnitude if you kind of ex exclude some of the, the, the EUB data, uh, particularly ruptures. Uh, what do the results look like? So here's some, here's some typical results, um, suitably uh, anonymized. Um, so, I mean, obviously you can get, we get some really good pictures overlaid on fantastic um, satellite imagery, imagery. So, but we've just cut out a small section here to, 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 show, uh, to show the risk, um, risk contours. So here we've got, uh, we've got two sets of risk contours. One's not on such a great uh, background, but there's one on a map here, which kind of shows the, um, the um, impact of, uh, it's got the line, it's got the 10 to the minus six contour. So in terms of the magnitude of, of risk, so it, if, if the actual leak frequency from the line is, is of the order of 10 to the minus four, and that's all, um, all leak sizes, so four big, large 
of league sizes that have extensive contours is obviously, you know, maybe maybe one order of mag or two orders of magnitude lower. So the actual risk contours from pipelines are generally um, are generally low uh, in terms of uh, in, in terms of the um, location specific individual risk. Um, here we can see the effect of of, of, of having valves and pumps um, on on the line, so you get a little sort of like a blip of um, of risk there. This one is a, a gas a gas line, um, not really that interesting, but here we've we've got um, um, something similar. We've got ten to the minus six and ten to the minus seven. Um, you know, um, you could you could live on that uh, that pipeline route and. Uh, uh, not exceed 10 to the minus five. So um, there is a block valve station in here, but it doesn't really show up uh, in the same way as it does for this, this liquid line, probably because this, this included some pumps that have quite a high leak, um, leak frequency. Here's a, here's a toxic line. Um, it's, it's an infield line somewhere. Um, and we can see that um, here, you've, uh, the, the line is, is, is quite small, it's only four inch. Uh, and it's four kilometers long uh, between these two um, well pads or valve stations. Um, you can see that the risk is higher, probably because you, with the toxics you don't get uh, you don't get a, any help by um, by the by not igniting. In fact, it might be the risk might be more. But um, so there's no there's no modification for ignition probability here, which which would reduce the risk. So the risks here are at order of magnitude higher. The line's also smaller, so we'd probably have a higher leak um, leak frequency. Um, but the uh, the consequences maybe aren't as extensive because it's a it's a it's a small diameter line and it's short. So, uh, and you can see this is um, been presented in in a cross section across the line and also in a um, a, uh, um, a picture. Here's some uh, typical risk results. Uh, sorry, here's an, a risk transept. So this is really just a slice through the contours. Helps you get a bit more sort of definition def definition on it. So again, we've got um, a 10 to the minus six, but about a thousand meters out and getting close to, but not exceeding 10 to the minus five. Um, FN curves, they kind, of, they kind of look like this with the, with the criteria on it and then um, then a line. Um, so this is the likelihood of this number of fatalities or more. So uh, other applications. So obviously we've talked about uh, pipelines extensively, but you can apply the same principles um, and I'm sure you can see how it could be done reasonably straightforwardly. So here we've got um, uh, rail transport of some flammable materials. So um, similarly, you're you're generating um, risk contours. We've got much we've got higher risk contours because derailment frequencies, um, particularly for short lines and maybe in this this sort of where they they've got crossings and, and they're shunting and things is much higher than the uh, the a gas uh, or or a liquid pipeline release. Um, so this was a transport of of crude. So um, there there is derailment data and. Um, and release data um, available. Um, here's the uh, here's something similar. So this was crude transport. You've got a you've got a um, higher risk area around the, the shunting yard because shunting incidents are are, are more significant, um, more likely. Um, we haven't selected the um, the spacing of the points here particularly well. So um, we've got this uh, rather poor resolution on things. So, but here's something a bit stylized. Um, but marine transport of hydrogen fluoride that uh, that that, uh, that we've just uh, we we did the project, but we've just created this as a a sort of a um, gen generic example. Um, so containers of, of hydrogen fluoride uh, transported by uh, by ship. Uh, coming out of out of a port, and um, we've, in a similar way, we've got um, we've got uh, risk contours. Um, the most esoteric uh, risk analysis I, I did on on pipelines and rail is where they they kind of met in the in the middle. Uh, I don't really have any pretty pictures because we did this uh, 
this sort of thing by a, by a spreadsheet, but it was the risk, if you can, if you can get your head around this, the risk of release pi to, from pipelines due to a derailed train hitting a pipeline. So, um, and the risk to passengers um, and maintenance crews from the, the ensuing release from the pipeline. And then also this, this um, service, which was in the Middle East, so that don't even, even know if you got built, was uh, was a risk from from sulfur fires, uh, and, and we built uh, we built this up um, it, as a, um, a sort of simple entry, but also well, quite a lot of complex entries in um, in Excel, and uh, here's just a, just an example that uh, that, uh, that we did. So, um, so here, here's my uh, concluding slide. I think we're in reasonable shape now. We've got 15 minutes for uh, for questions. So um, I'm saying that sort of uh, linear linear resources are they're they're kind of different um, to, to point ones, but um, but uh, but they can be modelled and, and different types of, of routes uh, routes can be modelled. Uh, there's, there's reasonable public domain in information out there to, to do it that's uh, that's sort of justified, um, and there's there's ample criteria to uh, to compare the the risk to. So um, thanks for um, for your attention, and I think I'm going to pass it over. Well, not pass it over, but pass the MCing over to uh, to Mark to um, field some questions. Thank you, George. Thank you for that uh, really excellent presentation. Um, I see that we're already getting questions coming in, so I hope you're I hope you're set. Um, Okay, so we have one, we have quite a lot of questions from one, one individual. Um, <laughs> so I'll, um, I, I won't choose all of them, but I'll go through a few of them. And then hopefully other questions will join in. Again, please use the uh, question and answer um, icon to post your questions online. And if you have a follow up question to any of the questions that are raised, please feel free to answer those questions ask those questions. Um, the first first question is to do with the directionality. Uh, so going back to your consequence modeling, can you explain the direction of the release, horizontal and vertical, that should be assumed? And should you look at obstructed and unobstructed releases differently within the consequence modeling that you do for pipelines? Uh, yes, I mean that was the that was the intent of the, the rule set that we, we we put up. So you you model all of those different consequences and then you you assign them a, a probability. So so the interaction of the uh, of the release with um, the, the the say the side of the uh, of the crater or the or the overburden or the base of it is is accounted for. I mean it it's it's a bit of a crude um, rule set, but you would you would you in within the model. So within the model, you would be modeling these. So these downward ones would be, would, would have the velocity reduced and uh, and the, and these would have the velocity reduced as well. And then, then there's a, a, a vertical release model. And these would all be, these would be modeled as impinged with that rule set or uh, as we said, and then they would be assigned a probability of, of occurring to do with the whole site size and the, um, and the sort of likely assumed likelihood of which direction the release is. And then the probabilities of all of these add up to one, and they're used to to, to chop up the um, the pipeline um, leak frequency into the appropriate sort of um, parts. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, uh, there's another really interesting one here, which also <laughs> coming from the same person. Um, industry data uh, provides failure frequency uh, of thousand kilometers per year. Most uh, pipelines have a design life of 25 to 30 years, uh, and this pipeline length varies, which might not equate to the 10,000, the thousand kilometers per year. So, how do you recalculate um, for actual pipeline based on these uh, these no notional failure frequencies? Um, well, I mean, the, the, da the data is just presented on a on a unit distance basis, so. Um, if, if you had a, a one kilometer pipeline, um, 
you uh, you would just generally apply um, a, a, sou a thousandth of that of that leak frequency. Uh, I mean, for I, I do take the point that there's, there's some there, there are some very short that I mean, there's, that's one of the the problems with the Alberta energy um, data is that it has some short pipelines that have higher leak frequencies. But generally, the the leak frequencies for the big trunk lines like um, oil and ga uh, natural gas lines are um, uh, they're very long. So I guess that's not really a very good answer, is it? But generally, no, we don't sort of account for the difference in length. We we apply that appropriately scaled for the for the leak frequency. <laughs> Thanks, George. I, I have one question sort of related to that. Um, in, in the UK, we've spent many years uh, increasing the pressure that are allowed to flow through our natural gas pipelines. They were they were originally designed to run up, say, 70, 80 bar, and now they may operate 100 bar, even higher than that, just based on the risk analysis of the probability of failure. Is that sort of detail change in operational characteristics of pipelines is that possible to be modelled using the QRAs that you do? Uh, in 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 some extent, it, it is for gas lines because there's information on the um, the design. Obviously, you'd be reducing the design factor, but um, so there is some correlations for for adjusting the leak frequency for that for that design factor. Um, I'm not sure there is for for for, for liquid lines. Um, now you're sort of venturing into kind of limit state design, which is kind of yeah. outside my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'd, I'd ask about the what what was the risk assessment that, that fed into to allowing that um, that increase, and, and what was the basis of that, and whether that could be used to in, in the in the QRA. Because. Yeah, that's that's beyond my 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 ability to answer that. I think it's to do with um, hoop stress analysis and all sorts of clever magic that they do with the maths. And again, modeling at Spade Adam and places like that. Well, yeah, um, I mean, this is materials have got better and, you know, um, QA has got better that they can push it closer to the sort of limit um, yeah. strength. So anyway. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, we'll just go on to a few more questions that have come through. Um, I don't want to ask a particular question about Safeti because, as you said, there are other models available, but there is one question about uh, modeling of the delay of ignition. Uh, OGP only recommend point, uh, 0.001. Are there any li other literature sources available for liquid releases that you could recommend for people to look at or to consider using? I'm not sure I quite understand understood the question okay i'll read it again industry yeah. data for delayed ignition is scarce ogp only recommends 0 0.001 can you recommend any other literature literature for delayed ignition frequency probability uh especially for liquid releases uh, oh no i can't off the top of my head i'd have to go and start to digging around um in the in the um, um in the literature um, so that's probably not very helpful. I mean, uh, generally we we run, we run consequences out to um, out to their sort of equilibrium. So um, it, where ignition does occur, it's, it's kind of conservative that um, that it uh, has a, it does occur. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, here's a question that is building on uh, one of your latest slides. Um, so. Can you describe how you would set up a QRA to find out the safe distance between an existing pipeline and a new railway? Should the speed <laughs> of the new trains be considered? The number of journeys expected? How would you do it? And the and Hesham says that the pipeline is running parallel to the to the railway. So without giving away all the trade secrets, how how would you sort of Describe the process of, of forming a QRA. <laughs> in in how many minutes? <laughs> oh, I, I I think you probably need a, a long chat, but let's let's give you a couple of minutes to answer that one. Um, oh, that's that's a, I'm, I'm, I've never never had that one uh, that one asked. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess uh, I mean when we did the pipeline. Um, um, the rail and pipeline interactions, it was um, it was. 
we they did some anal analysis based on the likelihood of uh, of the derailment um, uh, affecting the, uh, the, uh, the, pipe, the pipelines. So, uh, I mean, you'd probably follow that model and see if it's, firstly, if it's practical to, um, if it's even possible for, for a derailed train to, to affect a, a line. Because, I mean, I would have thought that uh, the, the spacing wouldn't have to be too large that it would to make it non-credible. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and certainly, if, you, if it was new, then you'd want to design that inherent level of safety in before even trying to get into any sort of QRA. Um, and, um, and then I guess you would, um, oh, oh yeah, well, so you talk about the risk, the risk from the pipeline. So if once you've addressed that bit, you could look at the risk from the, uh, the line to the, um, to the, to the rail route. And, and then that would just be a, like a normal pipeline um, Q, QRA. Uh, I suppose if you had to look at interactions between the two, then you could factor that into the pipeline QRA and add those events in as um, um, into the frequency. Okay. I, I, I suggest that Hesham gets in contact with uh, ourselves and you can follow up the discussion after, after the seminar. Um, I, I think time's moving on. So uh, again, George, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so we, we, we will wrap up now. Uh, just to let everybody know, uh, we have been recording the session, as you may remember from the beginning, and that recording will be available to you early next week. Uh, when you leave the seminar, you should automatically receive a survey in your browser. It only takes about 30 seconds to complete. So we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, that way we can learn from what we've done well and what we should do better in the future. If you have any questions arising from what you've heard today, or you'd like some information on any of our services, then please do simply email us direct and we will get back to you. Uh, feel free to visit our website and, or, and contact us through, through any of the forms there instead. Thank you, George, once again, and thank you everybody for your attention and staying up uh, late if it's the evening or taking time out from your work during the daytime. We're grateful to everybody for their time. Um, and I just like to say thank you very much. Um, just for your information, our next webinar is on the 25th of August at 3 p.m. BST, and it's about operational safety cases. Uh, hopefully, you could join us for that one too. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay secure, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Um, feel free to email me if you've got any further questions. I'll try and answer them. Thank you.